All right. Before we try to understand how exactly the control of blood glucose concentration happens uh, in detail and before we also go into the specifics on how insulin and glucagon control the blood glucose concentration i just want to talk a little bit about how glucose is actually entering or exiting the cell we have to do a little bit of revision and i have to add some information in now if you remember in chapter 4, I told you that glucose is a polar molecule and it cannot cross through the phospholipid bilayer directly because the phospholipid bilayer is a barrier against polar substances like ions or glucose and amino acids. Uh, so for the glucose to enter the cell, they have to enter the cell through a process known as facilitated diffusion where they use a carrier protein as I've highlighted here. Okay, so you have to add this into your notes now and you have to say that the name of the carrier protein that transports glucose is known as the GLUT protein, okay? And the GLUT protein is a transport protein that moves glucose by facilitated diffusion because these carrier proteins are very specific to only glucose molecules. So that's the first important thing we have to know. Okay. In the exam, if you mention GLUT protein, it's okay. If you also mention glucose transport proteins, that's fine as well. But personally, I would rather you mention the word GLUT protein, especially when you're talking about this part of the chapter. Now, a very important thing to also note is the effectors. Remember, if you look at this diagram here, I told you that the effectors that control the blood glucose concentration, that means they are the ones that do the corrective actions, are the liver and or skeletal muscle cells. Okay, so the liver and skeletal muscle cells, so you might be thinking, ah, the liver and skeletal muscle cells will have the GLUT proteins because they have to take in the glucose or remove the glucose depending on the situation. And for the most part, your answer would be almost right. Okay, now here's the important thing that you must understand. For the liver, the GLUT proteins are always on the cell surface membrane so they are always permeable to glucose so glucose can easily go into the cell or out of the cell no matter what how depending on the concentration gradient however for skeletal muscles the glut proteins are not always on the cell surface membrane because compare that where are the glut proteins the glut proteins are sometimes attached to vesicles depending on the situation, the vesicles will fuse with the cell surface membrane to make the GLUT proteins be on the surface. But it's not always there 100% of the time. So the liver is constantly permeable to glucose, but the skeletal muscle cells are not. So there is a bit of a distinction that you have to know between the two of them, and it makes more sense later. Now, another situation I just want to show you over here is, imagine for a second that I'm drawing out a liver cell on the left and the skeletal muscle cell on the right. And on the liver cell, you can see that the GLUT proteins are on the surface. But for the skeletal muscle cells, the GLUT proteins are attached to the vesicle membrane. Okay, so they are not on the cell surface membrane. And right now, the blood has a high blood glucose concentration. I don't need you to memorize this part yet because we will be seeing this more in detail in the next video. But the purpose of this video is to tell you how our cells try to take in glucose and once they take in the glucose, what do we try to do with the glucose molecules? So you see, the cell on the left, the liver cells, are constantly permeable to glucose because the GLUT proteins are there so glucose will have no problems entering the cell from a high to low concentration okay but for the skeletal muscle cells something needs to happen where the vesicle needs to fuse with the cell surface membrane and then only the GLUT proteins will be on the surface which allows glucose to enter so far so good now you can see that as the glucose enters the cell the blood glucose concentration returns back to optima because remember, we don't want it too high or too low. Okay, so this is good. Now, let's not worry about what happens in the blood. But the problem here is now the glucose is in the cells. Now, here's the thing. Because there's glucose in the cells, the cells do not want the glucose to escape out of the cells because glucose can easily move through the carrier proteins by diffusion. So the cell wants to try to retain the glucose in the cell as much as possible. 
One way the cell does this is by phosphorylating the glucose molecules. Phosphorylating the glucose molecule is just by adding the phosphate groups. Now, by adding the phosphate groups, it will change the shape of the glucose molecules a little bit so that they can no longer bind to the carrier proteins. And if they can no longer bind to the carrier proteins, they can no longer escape out of the cells. So they are trapped within the cell, as you can see over here. Okay, it's quite specific. So the carrier proteins are only specific to glucose, but not glucose phosphate. So that's the important thing that you have to understand for this. So by adding a phosphate group, you trap the glucose within the cells. So in this case, what does the cell do to the glucose? They use up some of the glucose for respiration, remember? And in the first step of glycolysis, it was phosphorylating the glucose. So this was one of the reasons as well. So the glucose will be used in respiration. And when the glucose is used in respiration, the cells can produce ATP. So as you can see, now what happens to the concentration of the glucose phosphate? The glucose phosphate concentration will then decrease. There we go. But not all the glucose phosphates will be used, or not all the glucose will be used in this case. And some of that glucose are still floating around in the cytoplasm. And it may affect the cell's water potential by lowering the water potential. We don't want it to lower the water potential too much because then water from the blood might rush into the cells. And if water in the blood rushes into the cells, what happens? Um, the cells might swell and burst. So... The solution to that is that excess glucose will be converted into glycogen because glycogen molecules are insoluble in water and they will not affect the cell's water potential. Now, some students will say, wait, I thought when you join glucose together, you get starch. That is true if you are a plant, but you are not a plant. Okay, you're not a Venus flytrap, you're a human. So in that case over there, for animals, because we are animal, we, because we fall under animals, as we have animal cells, we will convert glucose into glycogen instead, not starch. Okay, but they are just energy storage molecules. So these are the four important things I want you to know about the metabolism of glucose before we talk about insulin and glucagon in the next video. I want you to understand that we have these things called GLUT proteins, which are just glucose transport proteins, which carry out facilitated diffusion. GLUT proteins in liver cells are constantly on the cell surface membrane, but on the skeletal muscle cells, they are not. Sometimes the GLUT will be in the will be at the vesicle membrane and depending on the situation it can fuse to the cell surface membrane. Now when glucose enters the cell, the cell will phosphorylate the glucose to make sure it doesn't escape out of the cell. Some of that glucose will be used in respiration and most of the excess glucose will be converted into glycogen. If you understand this part, we are then ready for the next video where we talk about what exactly insulin does.